Thanks very much. It's, uh, it's great to be here this afternoon. As you know, for, for more than 90 years, the Economic Club of Chicago has provided a valued forum for current and future leaders to discuss issues of vital interest to this city and to our nation. And so it's, it's a terrific opportunity and an honor for me to be to, uh, here today to speak to you. At the Federal Reserve, uh, we seek to foster a strong economy for the benefit of individuals, families, and businesses throughout the country. And in pursuit of that overarching objective, Congress has assigned us the goals of maximum employment and stable prices, known as the dual mandate. So today I'm going to review recent economic developments, focusing on the labor market and on inflation, and then briefly touch on our longer-term growth prospects. I'll finish up with a discussion of monetary policy. I'm also going to refer to a series of slides that you'll see, and of course you can find those on our website if you're prone to that sort of thing. Um, so, starting with the economy, after what at times has been a slow recovery from the financial crisis and the Great Recession, growth has now picked up. Unemployment has fallen from 10 percent at its peak in October 2009 to 4.1 percent now, the lowest level in nearly two decades. 17 million jobs have been created in this expansion, and the monthly pace of job growth uh, remains more than sufficient to employ new entrants to the labor force. Uh, the blue line is uh, private sector job growth, the red is government on the left, and that's the three-month uh, job change, which you can see is at about 200,000, which is a strong level. The labor market has been strong, and my colleagues and I on the Federal Open Market Committee expect it to remain strong. Inflation has continued to run below the FOMC's 2% objective, but we expect it to move up in coming months and to stabilize around 2% in the medium term. And beyond the labor market, there are other signs of economic strength. We have steady income gains, rising household wealth, and elevated consumer confidence, which continue to support consumer spending, which accounts for about two-thirds of output. Business investment improved markedly last year following two subpar years, and both business surveys and prospect profit expectations point to further gains ahead. Fiscal stimulus and continued accommodative financial conditions are supporting both household spending and business investment, while strong global growth has boosted U.S. exports. As many of you know, each quarter FOMC participants, which include the members of the Board of Governors as well as the 12 Reserve Bank presidents, submit their individual projections for growth, unemployment, and inflation, as well as their forecasts of the appropriate path of the federal funds rate, which is our primary tool for monetary policy. Uh, these individual projections are compiled and then published in what we call the Summary of Economic Projections, or the SEP, in case I lapse into letters. FOMC participants submitted their most recent forecasts three weeks ago, and those forecasts show a strengthening in the medium-term outlook. As you can see, participants generally raised their forecast for growth between December and March, and they lowered their forecast for unemployment. In addition, many FOMC participants expressed greater confidence that inflation would move up to our 2% target. And the FOMC sees the risks to the economy as roughly balanced. As I mentioned, the, the headline unemployment rate has declined to levels not seen since the year 2000. The median projection in our March SEP calls for unemployment to fall well below 4% for a sustained period, something that has not happened since the late 1960s. This strong labor market forecast has important implications for the fulfillment of both sides of the dual mandate and thus for the path of monetary policy. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now exploring in some detail the state of the job market. And a good place to begin is with the statutory term maximum employment, which the FOMC takes to mean the highest utilization of labor resources that is sustainable over time. In the long run, the level of maximum employment is not determined by monetary policy, but rather by factors affecting the structure and dynamics of the labor market. Also, the level of maximum employment is not directly measurable, and it changes over time. Real-time estimates of maximum employment are highly uncertain. So recognizing this uncertainty, the FOMC does not set a fixed goal, a fixed numerical goal for maximum employment. Instead, we look at a wide range of indicators to assess how close the economy is to this statutory goal. Um, the headline unemployment rate is arguably the single best indicator of labor market conditions. In addition, it is widely known 
and updated each month, each month. And this is the number that everyone focused on, which is 4.1%, um, which is actually a bit below the FOMC's median estimate of the longer run normal rate of unemployment, which is 4.5%. However, the unemployment rate does not paint a complete picture. For example, to be counted in the official measure as unemployed, a person must have actively looked for a job in the past four weeks. People who have not looked for a job that recently are counted not as unemployed, but as out of the labor force, even though some of them actually want a job and are available for work. Others working part-time may want a full-time job, and still others who say that they do not want a job right now might be pulled into the job market if the right opportunity came along. So in judging tightness in the labor market, we also look at a range of other statistics beyond the headline unemployment rate, including alternative measures of unemployment, as well as measures of vacancies and job flows, surveys of households and businesses' perceptions of the job market, and of course, wages and prices. Figure three shows the headline unemployment rate in black and two broader measures of unemployment known as U5 in blue and U6 in red. U5 includes the unemployed plus people who say they want a job and have looked for one within the past year, though not in the last four weeks. U6, the broadest measure, includes all of those counted in U5 plus people who are working part-time and want a full-time job. And as you can see, like the headline unemployment rate, both of these alternative measures have declined significantly in recent years and are now at levels seen before the financial crisis. But they're not quite as low as they were in the years 1999 to 2000, which was a period of very tight job market conditions. The left panel in the next chart shows that employers say they are having about as much difficulty now attracting qualified workers as they did 20 years ago during that hot labor market. Likewise, the job vacancy rate shown on the right is close to its all-time high, as is the average number of weeks it takes to fill a job opening. Households also increasingly are reporting that jobs are plentiful on the left, which is consistent with the high level of job postings reported by firms. In addition, the proportion of workers quitting their jobs is high on the right, suggesting that workers are being hired away from their current employers and that others are confident enough about their prospects to leave jobs voluntarily, even before they've landed the next job. So, while the data I have discussed thus far do point to a tight labor market, other data are less definitive. The labor force participation rate, which measures the percentage of working age individuals who are either working or actively looking for a job, has remained steady for about the last four years on the left. Uh, this flat performance is actually a sign of improvement since increased retirements as our population ages have been putting downward pressure on participation and will continue to do so. On the right, you can see uh, this is a, it shows the ratio of those who are over 65 to the total working age population, which has been rising as well. However, the participation rate of prime age workers, that is workers between the ages of 25 and 54, has not recovered fully to its pre-recession level. And that suggests that there may still be room, there may still be room to pull more people into the labor force. This is males on the left and females on the right on this chart. Indeed, the strong job market does appear to be drawing some people back who've been out of the labor force for a significant time. For example, the percentage of adults returning to the labor force after previously reporting that they were not working because of a disability has increased over the past couple of years. And anecdotal reports indicate that employers are increasingly willing to take on and train workers they would not have considered in the past. Wage growth, by many measures, two of which are shown here, has also remained moderate compared to the pre-crisis era, though it has picked up compared with its pace in the early part of the recovery. Weak productivity growth is an important reason why we have not seen larger wage gains in recent years. At the same time, the absence of a sharper acceleration in wages suggests that the labor market is not excessively tight. And I will be looking for an additional pickup in wage growth as the labor market strengthens further. Taking all of these measures of labor utilization on board, what can we say about the state of the labor market relative to our statutory goal of maximum employment? Well, 
Um, while uncertainty around the long run level of these indicators is substantial, many of them do suggest a labor market that is in the neighborhood of maximum employment. A few other measures continue to, to suggest some remaining slack. Uh, assessments of the maximum level of employment are uncertain, however, and subject to revision. As we seek the highest sustainable utilization of labor resources, the committee is going to be guided by incoming data across all of these broad range of measures. That brings me to inflation, the other leg of the dual mandate. Uh, the substantial improvement in the labor market has been accompanied by low inflation. Indeed, inflation has continued to run below our 2% longer run objective. And this is, uh, the red is headline unemployment and the black is what we call core, uh, core uh, sorry, headline inflation. The black is core inflation, which excludes food and energy prices. Consumer prices, uh, by our preferred measure, increased 1.8% over the 12 months ending in February. The core price index, uh, which is typically a better indicator of future infl inflation, rose 1.6% over the same period. In fact, both of these indexes have been below 2% consistently for the past half dozen years. This persistent shortfall in inflation from our target has led some to question the traditional rate relationship between inflation and the unemployment rate, also known as the Phillips curve. Given how low the unemployment rate, why aren't we seeing higher inflation now? As those of you who carefully read the minutes of each FOMC meeting are aware, and I know some of you are out there, we had a thorough discussion of inflation dynamics at our January meeting. Almost all FOMC participants thought that the Phillips curve remains a useful basis for understanding inflation. They also acknowledged, however, that the link between labor market tightness and changes in inflation has become weaker and more difficult to estimate, reflecting in part the extended period of low and stable inflation in the, in the United States and other advanced economies. Participants also noted that other factors, including importantly inflation expectations and also tr transitory changes in energy and import prices also affect inflation. My own view is that the data continue to, to continue to show a relationship between the overall state of the labor market and the change in inflation over time. That connection has clearly weakened over the past couple decades, but it still persists and I believe it still continues to be meaningful for monetary policy. Much of the shortfall in inflation in recent years is well explained by high unemployment during the early years of the recovery and by falling energy prices and the rise of the dollar in 2015-2016. But the decline in inflation last year as the labor market conditions improved significantly was a bit of a surprise. The 2017 shortfall from our 2% goal appears to reflect, at least in part, some unusual price declines such as for mobile phone plans that occurred nearly a year ago. In fact, monthly inflation readings have been firmer over the past several months and the 12-month change should move up notably this spring as last spring's soft readings drop out of the 12-month calculation. Consistent with this view, the median of FOMC participants' projections in our March survey shows inflation moving up to 1.9% this year and 2% in 2019. Although job creation is strong and unemployment low, the U.S. economy continues to face some important longer-term challenges. GDP growth has averaged just over 2% in the current economic expansion, much slower than in previous expansions. Even the higher growth seen in recent quarters remains below the trend before the crisis. Nonetheless, the unemployment rate has come down six percentage points during the current expansion, which suggests that the trend growth that's necessary to keep the unemployment rate unchanged has shift down, shifted down materially. Uh, the median FOMC participants' projection of the longer-run trend growth rate right now is 1.8%, which is pretty close to the latest estimate from the blue-chip consensus of private forecasters, which is around 2%. Um, to unpack this discussion a little further, we can, think of, we can think of output growth as composed of increases in hours worked and increases in output per hour, also known as productivity growth. And here, uh, a comparison with the, the last expansion from 2001 to 2007 is informative. Output growth in that earlier expansion averaged nearly 3% per year, well above the pace in the current expansion. But despite that faster output growth, average job growth in that expansion was a half a percentage point weaker than the current expansion. 
And the explanation is, of course, productivity, which was growing at more than twice the pace in the last expansion as it's grown in the current years. <clears throat> Taking a longer view, uh, the average pace of labor productivity growth since 2010 is the slowest since World War II and about a quarter of the average post-war rate. Again, this is growth in output per hour. This is a, a five-year moving average. Moreover, the productivity growth slowdown seems to be global and is evident even in countries that were not affected by the financial crisis. Um, this is a bit of a complicated chart, but uh, I'll explain it. So this is data for all 34 of the OECD countries, which are the, the wealthy countries. Um, almost all of them show slower productivity increases uh, than in the, so over the last decade than in the prior decade. And the red lines that go down below the axis there, uh, they show the extent of the slowdown. You can see the United States, the slowdown in productivity in the United States in this last decade versus the one before that is right in the middle of the pact, pact. So this is a global phenomenon. And this, this suggests that the factors uh, specific to the United States are probably not the main drivers. When something happens all over the world, it's generally not uh, specifically about domestic drivers. As shown in this next figure, uh, labor productivity growth can be broken down itself into contributions from business investment or capital deepening, changes in the skills and work experience of the workforce, and a residual component that is attributed to other factors like technological change and efficiency gains which are usually lumped together under the term total factor productivity. This is interesting. You can see there are, there are two high periods and two low periods since 1948. Uh, 2004 to 2017 on the right is very low. Um, and to break these down, the blue chart, that's, that's improvements in labor quality. So you can see that hasn't changed much over time. The red is capital investment. And you can see that is part of the explanation for the slowdown. And the gray is total factor productivity, which is probably the biggest ex explanation. Um, so in the US and all around the world, some of the slowdown in productivity can be traced to weak investment after the crisis. Investment has picked up recently in the United States, however, which suggests that capital deepening may pick up as well. The, big the other big contributor to the slowdown has been in total factor productivity growth, as I mentioned. That's the gray. Uh, the outlook for this dimension of productivity is considerably more uncertain. Total factor productivity growth is notoriously difficult to predict, and there are sharply different views on where it might be heading. Some argue that the productivity gains from the information technology revolution are behind us, and that more recent technological in innovations have less potential to boost productivity. Others argue that a well-documented decline in measures of business dynamism, that is, things like the number of startups, the closure of less productive businesses, uh, and the rates at which workers quit their jobs and move around the country to take new jobs, that that slowdown in dynamism has held back productivity growth in part by slowing down the movement of capital and labor to their most productive uses. But uh, new technological breakthroughs in many areas, robotics, biotech, um, artificial intelligence, to name a few, have led others to take a more optimistic view. They point to substantial productivity gains from innovation in areas like energy production and e-commerce. In addition, the optimists point out that advances in technology often take decades to work their way into the economy before their ultimate effects on productivity are felt. And that delay has been observed even for game-changing innovations like the steam engine and electrification, which ultimately produced broad increases in productivity and living standards. So in this view, we just need to be patient uh, and, and wait for the new technologies to diffuse throughout the economy. Um, but uh, I think the, the longer view is that only time will tell who has the better view here, the optimists or the pessimists. Uh, the record provides little basis to believe that we can accurately forecast the, the rate of increase in productivity. Um, the other principal contributor to output growth, though, as I mentioned, is hours worked. Uh, and hours gro work, gro growth in hours worked, in turn, is largely determined by growth in the labor force. Now, growth in the labor force has averaged only a half a percent since the year 2010, well below the average in previous decades, as you can see. One reason for the slower growth of the labor force, a main reason, is that baby boomers are aging and retiring, and that trend will continue. Another reason, though, is that the labor force participation rate of people between the ages of 25 and 54, those prime age individuals, 
declined from 2010 to 2015, and it remains low. Indeed, the participation rate for prime age men has been falling for more than 50 years, while women's participation in this age group rose throughout the 1990s and then turned downward and has now fallen for the last 20 years. <clears throat> These trends in participation have been more pronounced in the United States than in other advanced economies. Uh, and that's what this next slide shows. So the, the blue bars are the current level of productivity, sorry, of labor force participation. And this is uh, 22 OECD countries. The, we're the dark blue line. You can see today we're second to last uh, among labor force participation for men on the left and third to last for, for women on the right. The circles represent uh, uh, where we were in 1990. Um, and you can see that for men, we were in the middle of the pack, and for women, we were actually high at that point. There's really no consensus about the reasons for this long time decline in prime age participation rates in the United States, and a variety of factors could have played a role. For example, while automation and globalization have contributed positively to overall domestic production and growth, adjustment to these developments has resulted in dislocations of many workers without college degrees and those employed in manufacturing. <clears throat> In addition, factors such as the increase in disability roles in recent decades and the opioid crisis may have reduced the supply of prime age workers. Given that the declines have been larger here, though, than in other countries, it does seem likely that the factors, that factors specific to the United States have played an important role here in contrast to productivity. As I noted earlier, the strong economy may, may continue to pull some prime age individuals back into the labor force and encourage others not to drop out. Research suggests that structurally oriented measures, for example, improving education or fighting the opioid crisis, will also help to raise labor force participation in this age group. So to summarize this discussion, some of the factors weighing on longer term growth in the United States are likely to be persistent, particularly the slowing in growth of the labor force. Others are hard to predict, like productivity. But as a nation, we are not bystanders. We can put policies in place that will support labor force participation and give us the best chance to achieve broad and sustained increases in productivity, and thus in living standards. These policies are mostly outside the toolkit of the Federal Reserve, such as those that support investment in education and worker skills, business investment and research and development, and investment in infrastructure. Uh, let me now turn to monetary policy. In the aftermath of the financial crisis, <coughs> pardon me, uh, the FOMC went to extraordinary lengths to promote the recovery, support job growth, and prevent inflation from falling too low. As the recovery advanced, it became appropriate to begin reducing monetary policy support. Since monetary policy affects the economy with a lag, waiting until inflation and, um, and employment hit our goals before reducing policy support could have led to a rise in inflation to unwelcome levels. In such circumstances, monetary policy might need to tighten abruptly, which could disrupt the economy or trigger a recession. As a result, to sustain the expansion, the FOMC adopted a gradual approach to reducing monetary policy support. We began in December 2015 by raising our target for the federal funds rate for the first time in nearly a decade. Since then, with the economy improving, but inflation still below target and some slack remaining, the committee has continued to gradually raise interest rates. This patient approach also reduced the risk that an unforeseen blow to the economy might push the federal funds rate back near zero, its effective lower bound, thus limiting our ability to prov provide appropriate monetary policy accommodation. In addition, after careful planning and public communication, last October the FOMC began to gradually and predictably reduce the size of the Fed's balance sheet. Reducing our securities holdings is another way to move the stance of monetary policy toward neutral. The balance sheet reduction process is going smoothly and is expected to contribute over time to a gradual tightening of financial conditions. Over the next few years, the size of our balance sheet is expected to shrink significantly. At our meeting last month, the FOMC raised the target range for the federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point, bringing it to one and a half to one and three quarters percent. This decision marked another step in the ongoing process of gradually scaling back monetary policy accommodation. 
our patient approach has paid dividends and contributed to the strong economy we have today. Over the next few years, we will continue to aim for 2% inflation and for a sustained economic expansion with a strong labor market. As I mentioned, my FOMC colleagues and I believe that as long as the economy continues broadly on its current path, further gradual increases in the federal funds rate will best promote those goals. It remains the case that raising rates too slowly would make it necessary for monetary policy to tighten too abruptly down the road, which could jeopardize the expansion. But raising rates too quickly would increase the risk that inflation would remain persistently below our 2% objective. And our path of gradual rate increases is intended to balance these two risks. Of course, our views about appropriate monetary policy in the months and years ahead will be informed by incoming data and the evolving outlook. If the outlook changes, so too will monetary policy. Our overarching objective will remain the same, fostering a strong economy for all Americans, one that provides plentiful jobs and low and stable inflation. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.